what Jesus actually was was teaching. And what he was teaching is that we're all essentially Christ. We all have Christ within us. And I feel like it's such a simple idea and people overlook that. Mm -hmm. You know, we like we dismiss the idea that we all have that Christ consciousness within us and we bow down to the icon of what Jesus is. And it's it's falsity. That's not the truth. The truth is that we all have the ability to come to that Christ consciousness within all of us. And what is Christ consciousness? Christ consciousness is essentially um, it's uh, realizing your true being. It's like realizing that 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 peace in heaven is within all of us. And what does that mean? That means that. We're, what do we all want to be? We all want to be happy. We all want to be free. We all want to be at peace. Well, it's possible. We are all capable of doing that. And that's what exactly what Jesus was saying. It just got lost in translation over 2,000 years. Like the way he put it 2,000 years ago, fast forward to now, it's a totally, like we take it in such a different way. And maybe it was corrupted over the years by the Catholic Church and they used it for control. But either way, we're just so far disconnected from what the teachings of Jesus were. And he was just trying to he was just trying to wake up the world essentially. He was just trying to tell people like, look, you can it's not just me. Like, when he said I'm the son of God, like he that meant that meant like because I'm the son of God, that means you're also the son of God. Is and he didn't he didn't speak like he was higher than anybody else. He didn't say like worship me. He but that's how we interpret it nowadays. We interpret it as that he he was the king and he he saved us. It's like, no, man, his mindset saved him. Essentially, that's what he was saying. He, he gained salvation through Christ consciousness and that you can also gain salvation through that same exact consciousness and save yourself. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a lot more symbolism in there, too, in terms of like the how Jesus sacrificed himself. You know, we uh you know the symbol of the cross is is a symbol of again it's not a symbol of jesus it's a symbol of the sacrifice that we make once we come to that consciousness we sacrifice a little bit of ourself for others you know love love god love thy neighbor love god like you love yourself that's that's essentially like you you give up a little bit of yourself for your neighbor for your brothers and sisters that's how i interpret it at least that's how I interpret Jesus' words. I feel like it's so simple to really internalize, yet we just, we just, we just don't. Mm. I don't know why, you know. And and like I said, Jesus wasn't the only one talking about this. I don't think. I I think there's plenty of other people that put it in different ways. Mm. There's plenty of other, you know, ascended masters. I call them of uh, of the of the East, like Ramana Maharshi, uh, Yogananda. These people are preaching the same exact thing of Brahman and Atman. These are all the same ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. And we just, I don't know. There's just something that just gets lost in translation for some reason because we get lost in the symbols. We think, the, you know, the finger pointing at the moon. I think oh, we yeah. talked about this before. We, we yeah. confuse the, the, the symbol of the finger. Wait, can wait? How, how do you explain that? No, it, it, <laughs> well, like the master is basically just pointing at the moon, and if you get stuck on the finger, you're not going to see what he's pointing at, moon. right? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, the moon is the it. yeah. It's basically the experience behind the symbols, right? I mean, the behind every word or symbol or concept, there's a reality, a tangible experiential reality. And so, if you get focused too much on the symbol, you're going to miss out on the actual reality that it is trying to express or communicate to you, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, I completely agree, man. And I don't know what caused the distortion, but your your reading of, of Christ is definitely in alignment with my understanding of it as well. And I think, you know, there is that sort of, let's call it the mystical level um, of Christ teaching where he's talking about the Christ, the, the Christ consciousness, Christ within. Um, but I think at a more practical level, there are lots of things that are at face value, very much useful, uh, very much true. Um, and it, I think it really boils down to DBD. Don't be a dick. That's essentially yeah. the the ethical teaching of Christ in a nutshell. Don't be a dick. Yep. Why don't you try being nice, right? Why don't you stop judging this guy 
about the piece of, you know, why don't you stop trying to pull the piece of wood out of your neighbor's eye when you've got a fucking rafter sticking out of your own eye? Like, mm -hmm. worry about yourself. Stop judging other people. Be nice. Don't be a dick, right? At a very practical level, Jesus was basically saying that. And he hung out with the, you know, the beggars and the prostitutes and the sickly people. Like you were saying, he wasn't holding himself above others. No, to the contrary, he was like the Tao. He held himself below everyone. And that's how he was able to help people, right? Yeah. He was humble um, because you have to be humble when you awaken or touch that part of you that he was trying to describe the Christ consciousness. You realize that you're not doing anything. It's not Oliver. It's not like I'm doing anything. Mm -hmm. It's all this, this power, this being um, expressing itself in infinite forms. And I'm just one of those forms. So it's like, how am I going to get on a high horse? Right? Yeah. Yeah. You're serving. Exactly. And you, you brought that up too. There is sacrifice in service. Every time you do an act of service to another person, to your community, to something that's greater than you, it's a form of sacrifice because you're taking time, energy, mm -hmm. knowledge, you know, labor, whatever it is, and you're giving it up, right? You could be using that stuff for yourself to better yourself or improve your conditions, but you're giving it, right? And there is, there is a huge amount of sacrifice in that every time you do it. It's a yeah. sacrifice. <clears throat> I think that's the essence of just being a human being, man. That's just how to, that is the way that is the Tao essentially. I mean, mm -hmm. putting it very, very simply putting it very, very, you know, 21st century sense. Like you said, just be a good person. Don't be a dick. Yeah. Don't be you a know? dick. It's not that hard. It actually feels good when you're not a dick. <laughs> you know, it feels good to yeah. be nice to people sometimes, you know? Exactly. Yeah. And then the, yeah, we all, we all do it in our own way though. You know, we, we don't, we don't really do it like Jesus. We don't all have to be nailed to the cross. Mm -hmm. I do it in my way. You do it in your way. But it's it's the it's the spirit behind it. Yeah, that, that mean that's what it means. Is we all have the ability to come to that consciousness in our heart, and then we conduct it in our own way. And that's that's essentially the teachings of Buddha too. Buddha taught the same exact thing. Uh, you know, we all have the Buddhahood within us, but we we're not all Buddha. No. Buddha didn't create Buddhism. Jesus didn't create Christianity. It's all the people around it that see them as a symbol. Yeah. It's yeah. He was trying to show us a way of being and doing in the world. And we, instead of following that, or trying to take that advice. We just started worshiping the dude. <laughs> and the yeah. dude is like the, you know, Jesus, the man was just a guy. There's nothing yeah. to worship there. The thing that was special about Jesus is in every single person. The thing that we should be worshiping is in ourselves. And we should be bringing that thing to life, not looking at some dude who died 2000 years ago and just following him uh, as, yeah. you know, people follow him. It's like, don't follow him, practice what he was talking about and see what happens. Yeah. You know, it's like, well, it's, it's, you follow, not follow. It's like you follow in his footsteps. So mm. You walk, you walk his path. You That's don't right. follow him. Like, like you follow, um, you know, like an idol, like you don't, mm -hmm. you know, you don't like bow down. You just, you just walk the path that he walked. Yeah. I think that's what they mean by follow. And that's why the words are misinterpreted mm -hmm. because our, especially the English language, the words have multiple meanings and multiple interpretations on the words. So yeah. it's understandable. It's understandable why they got lost in translation. But I think now <clears throat> this is the second coming. We're, we're literally living through the second coming of Christ. And it, like I said, it's not, it's not like Jesus coming down and saying, what's up, everybody? I'm back. It's, it's 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 coming back right here yeah in all of us yeah in our hearts to be alive. absolutely exactly. yeah a little scary sometimes a little nerve-wracking but i think overall yeah when you take that view of it it's it's um a great privilege and an honor to be uh alive in this day and age right i mean it's it's crazy yeah it can be tough definitely yeah. it can be tough because there's a lot of shit going on that's for sure mm -hmm. but i'd rather feel all that than nothing at all that's for sure yeah, it's definitely interesting. I think there's an English saying: "It's may you be born in interesting times." <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a curse. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it is, but yeah, I think some people used to uh, wish that upon their enemies. You know. <laughs> Wait, you said you mean they use that as a curse? Yeah, they'd be like, "May you live in interesting times," like as in that 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 would be a bad thing, right? Because it's like turmoil, chaos, uncertainty, all these crazy things that are happening, right? So. I think originally it was meant as a curse, but yeah, I don't know. I could be wrong. Oh, that's interesting. I've actually didn't know that, but that kind of, that makes sense. Yeah, I guess because, you know, human beings like stability. We like that sense of just like, okay, we're good. You know, we don't have to worry about anything, but that's just, 
I don't know. That's just an illusion. A hundred percent impermanence, right? Transience. That's the reality. And because of our sort of, you know, let's say biological limitations, our sensory, you know, instruments, the things that we can see, it, we have this illusion that there's permanence, like that things are stable and that they're just concrete and they're going to be there forever. Um, but underneath that appearance or that facade, everything is constantly in flux, right? At an atomic or subatomic level, it's just like freaking ghost particles popping in and out of existence. So, you know, we have this illusion that things are pretty stationary and stable, but in reality, everything is constantly flowing and nothing stays the same, right? Yeah. Heraclitus said, no man steps in the same river twice because he's not the same man and baby, it ain't the same river, mm. right? Because everything is constantly changing. So, yeah, I think the illusion of permanence and our sort of, um, uh, like the, the way that we kind of grip it or like we want things to stay a certain way definitely makes it hard for us because that's not the way things are. They're constantly changing. Yeah. That's Buddhism one-on-one right there. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, I mean, you don't even need Buddhism. I think anybody who, who just takes the time to observe it, will see it in their own life too. Right. Yeah. It's just that we, we latch on to the, like, we want that, like there's something in the human brain that wants that stability. Like we want to know, like we want to live forever essentially that's what it is we don't want to die I and mean, we don't want the things that we have in our life to die or the concepts that we have in our life or like the things that we got like money or a car or arrangements you know, like circumstances arrangements. yeah we don't want those things to fade because for some reason in the human psyche we just think that brings us comfort but the truth is and you can't hide from the truth the truth is nothing lasts all of, everything is transitory and that's what they say in Buddhism is the mm -hmm. world is transitory. And the more you latch on to this transitory temporary world, the more it's going to cause you suffering. Yeah. It's, it's, um, I mean, it's, it's scary. It would be scary to someone that has no clue what that, even that concept means, but it's the truth. Mm -hmm. You can't like, you can't deny that. Like, you know, there's, you can hide from it all you want and run away from it all you want, but eventually it's going to catch up to you mm -hmm. and eventually you're going to, you know, suffer, you know, I don't know if suffer is the right word, the dukkha, you know, you're, yep. you're going to feel what it feels to lose something eventually somewhere along the way. And it's going to cause you suffering. It's going to cause you inner turmoil. Yep. And until you, until you, I'm, I'm kind of like speaking to myself here, you know, I'm not like trying to preach until no. you, until you come to that, realization that it's all going to fade it, it's, it's just going to be a constant hamster wheel of um just i guess suffering is the word you know the constant just feeling unease yeah because it's gonna happen no matter what absolutely man um it's not just the buddhist my friend marcus aurelius he says the cosmos is constant change and our lives are but a series of choices <laughs> how simple is that just That's a good. series of choices what was the second half? The second sentence? The cosmos is constant change and our lives are but a series of choices. Hmm. That's good. I wonder yeah. how did he get, where did he get all this like teach? Like where did he learn this stuff? You know, I've read meditations like once mm -hmm. or twice and I'm just like, wow, this guy was very learned. Yeah, the Stoics were, I mean, they had a, a long history, right? They started in uh, in Athens uh, under Zeno, and then it kind of made its way to Rome over time. And then the Roman Stoics kind of took it in a slightly different direction from what I understand. I haven't studied the Greek Stoics, so I don't actually know where it started. Um, but the Romans were really all about um, the sort of practical aspects of it. But um, yeah, the you know, impermanence is something, again, that in the uh, Hellenic world, like, uh, like I mentioned, Heraclitus, he he came up with that a long time ago before the Stoics even. And then uh, Pythagoras as well, like he developed a whole system of like esoteric philosophy. And basically it all comes from the same source. I think if you go back far enough, you're going to find like a handful of like um, what they called mystery schools. Like they had like the, the mystery school of uh, Isis and Osiris uh, in Egypt. Um, they had similar like uh, mystery schools in Greek and uh, the Eleusian mysteries, right? Which is like a huge festival that they had regularly and Marcus was a participant. So I think some of these things were like, you know, esoteric knowledge that was passed on in kind of these um, symbolic uh, rituals uh, every, every year or every, you know, whatever, every time. So I think they all kind of shared some of that knowledge, but uh, who knows where it came from. I think India is probably the best bet.
in my opinion, but maybe it came from a bunch of different spots. I don't know. Well, it's interesting you mentioned the Elysium Mysteries because supposedly, you know, they did some kind of psychedelic substance or something that they don't know of. I know there's some substance that they don't know what it is. Like they mm -hmm. partook in some kind of... You mixed it into the wine, I hear. Yeah. So that that's where it came from. It came from the source, you know, they opened themselves up through the through using these uh, entheogenic substances. Because it's yeah. weird, like when you do those things in the correct setting, you it's like information download. Mm -hmm. You're able to just like learn things, not through a book, not through a conversation. You're just able to just sit there and meditate and learn things and take in information and universal truths. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's interesting. I didn't never knew Marcus Aurelius actually did that. Like he might have done psychedelics. So that's... yeah, if they were doing it at the Eleusian Mysteries, then he most likely did. Yeah, and Plato went through them, and uh, yeah, Pythagoras. And you know, for, I'm reading this book right now by a Manly P. Hall called uh, "The Secret Teachings of All Ages," and he's there's a lot of this stuff I'm getting from him. But you know, he kind of traces all of these mystery schools, and um, he, in the chapter on Pythagoras, which was super interesting, I never knew anything about Pythagoras besides triangles <laughs> from like elementary school, you know, arithmetic or whatever. But he like went to Egypt. Egypt and he was initiated into their mysteries and he went to Babylon and he was initiated into their mysteries and he went to India and he was initiated into their mysteries. And then he came back to Asia Minor and he started his own school. So you can imagine he basically took the, uh, what, what, I guess the parallels that all of these mysteries held in common and he brought them back and then he made his own school in, in Greece. Right. So, um, yeah, it, it, it it wouldn't surprise me that psychedelics were involved because like if you if you take a decent dose of you know psilocybin and you close your eyes and you see those geometric shapes like just think of our like long distant ancestors who first started tripping like the hunter gatherers there's no geometric shapes in nature you don't see perfect triangles or squares or anything in nature so these people when they close their eyes they would have seen something that no one else no other human being had ever seen and then to to use those images to create like the way we use it now, like the fact that we understand, you know, we can build archways, we understand the geometric shapes and we understand their value and their purpose. But like at some point, those things didn't exist. Yeah. Yeah. It just fucks my mind up to think that like a perfect square or a triangle or these shapes don't, don't exist in nature. And so the first people who saw them when they closed their eyes on a mushroom trip, they were like the first people to kind of discover these shapes, which are, you know, hidden in nature, I guess. Yeah, that's interesting. I guess I've never really thought there was never there was a time before geometry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Isn't that a trip? Or like, because I'm especially now, like, look in your in your room behind you. I see like a nice rectangle picture frame and the door, and you know all these like straight lines. Th that shit doesn't exist in nature, so it would have been like a novelty for them to discover this. Yeah, that's very interesting, man. I've heard of that. Like, people just see these shapes or like uh, hieroglyphs on substances and you know like what is that is that just imprinted into our dna is that somewhere in our mind from over lifetimes you know and it just we have to unlock it you know yeah. it's like it's like where is these where do these things come from that's what i want to know it's just because it's more than just getting high mm -hmm. take mushrooms it's more than just like oh the code man i felt crazy it's like you're unlocking answers you're on you're it's giving you some kind of uh information that you didn't have before if you use it in the correct way mm -hmm. and it's just to me that's the most interesting thing about these things is that you're 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 literally almost making yourself smarter like you know what i mean you're 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 widening your intellect in a way you're tapping so, into something tapping in tapping yeah. into the source yeah and and these answers or these ideas exist independently of us like you know you would think yeah. you know it, at some level you know the the logical answer would be that humans uh over time you know invented geomet you know geometry or they started to like draw shapes and but it's like no no those shapes existed somewhere Right. And we tapped into that space with the help of some plants or some fungus or whatever. Uh, and, and then, yeah, we were able to discover these things. I mean, it, it's kind of crazy to think, but you know, there it is. You know, and that, and that makes me wonder, like, what's next? Mm. What, what else are we going to discover? Because that's not the end. I don't think we that's the thing about humans, too, now is that we think we know everything. Mm. We think this is it. We got Google. That's it. We, we know everything there's, you need to know about the world. But I don't, I don't think that's true whatsoever. Oh, no way. 
No way. I mean, like, yeah, I mean, the, the farther out we go or the, the deeper down we go, like, you know, trying to get down to like subatomic particles and the, you know, the large Haldron collider smashing particles together to see if we can create or discover new particles. Right. Um, every, they, they've been doing that for a while now, like 50, 60 years, and they're still coming up with new shit. They're still trying to get down to that fundamental unit of matter and discovering that there is no matter <laughs> you get down to the quark level. And it's like, there's nothing there. It's just an energy pattern. And so yeah. I don't think we're done either, man. And the further out we go as well, like, you know, we took a picture of a black hole, I think two years ago, right? Yeah. yeah we're just scratching that. the surface. We're sending a fucking helicopter to Mars. <laughs> like yeah. we're just starting. We're just yeah. getting started. I always say this is the beginning of the future. Yeah. Like, this is the beginning very true. of the Jetsons. Like we live in the transitory, the, the, oh, excuse me. We live in the transitional period from, you know, us living in like the, um, like, uh, how do I explain it? Like almost like the analog era mm -hmm. moving into like this digital futuristic era where we're, we're constantly involved with technology and, you know, we're just like a whole new, like we're, our being is changing totally. Like we're just completely changing, but we're not like there yet. We're still mm -hmm. stuck in the analog world where we're just like kind of, you know, stuck in the past. Like we're still using fossil fuels for cars. You know, like there's still remnants of the old world mm -hmm. but we're getting there. And it's interesting to see. It's interesting to see like how we're changing and changing so fast too. Mm -hmm. It's like within, we'll say like by like 2030, it's going to look completely different. The world is going to be, be look completely different to, than how it looks now. Yeah, no doubt about it. I mean, it's we already- even have aliens. <laughs> if we're lucky, <laughs> we're lucky. Uh, yeah, no, I, I agree, man. I mean, it's, um, and again, my only question is which direction is it going to change in like for the better or for the worse. Right. Um, and that's a very, uh, dualistic black and white way of looking at it. You know, I'm oversimplifying it, but I'm, you know, I'm thinking like climate change and all these other things that are kind of ramping up. It's like, it could be, we could be moving into a Star Trek like future, uh, or into a dystopian post-apocalyptic future. <laughs> and we'll right. see, we'll know soon, but yeah, I think it can go either way still. I'm not convinced, uh, that, that it's going to get better or worse. I think it's, it's still up in the air for me. Yeah, I think it'll get worse before it gets better, but humans are a very adaptable species. Like we we just survive things. Like we mm -hmm. just get through things. Even even if it's just like crazy struggle and there are like cataclysmic events and just like horrible things that happen. Either way, we're gonna survive. Unless like an asteroid comes down mm. and destroys the earth, then even then we probably still survive. I think humans are very, very adaptable to their environment because we we just I don't know, we just consciously evolve to things like no matter what like with this pandemic for instance like mm -hmm. we that this is so far out of the idea of our perception just two years ago but we've adapted so quick to it like if you went out to the store and you saw someone without a mask you'd be like what's up with that guy yeah why is he not wearing a mask when before if it was you saw somebody with a mask you'd be like what's up with that guy why is he wearing a mask <laughs> yeah so it's just it's like we adapt to and change so easily yeah so i think yeah it might from the on the outside world it might things might happen shit's gonna happen you know the world is chaos but ultimately it's only gonna get better i see it maybe i'm a little optimistic i don't know maybe I'm a little too idealistic but i think humans are just uh very uh very rugged species you know we just we just we've all we've been through a lot of shit in the past mm -hmm. i think we can get through whatever we're gonna go through in the future I hope so, man. I hope so. Cause I think this is the most interesting shit that the solar system's got going on. So I just hope it goes, <laughs> keeps going for a little bit, but yeah, no, I, I, some days I feel very optimistic and other days I'm like, uh, I don't yeah. know. I don't know anymore. <laughs> so I'm just trying to reserve judgment and just take it day by day, you know? Yeah, that's just true. I mean, if you pay attention to the news, then you're going to probably think the world sucks, but I don't know. It's, I don't think it really does. I think we're, we're on the right page. You know what the problem is? Is like we see the news for seven and a half billion people on earth now. And they're yeah. way too connected. And we see all the horrible things. And of course, the news reports are all the horrible things. Yeah. Uh, so we see all that and we're like, oh, the world's going to shit. But like, it's, I don't think it actually is. It's just because we get to see all the shit now. We get yeah, to I agree. See everything that's happening in the world. And uh, yeah, I don't know. Just got to disconnect a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. It, or at least bear in mind when you're reading the news or watching the news that this is like, they're only going to show you the most extreme stuff and most yeah. of it's going to be a negative 
bias or a negative slant or whatever, but yeah, it's hard. Right. And I was talking to my friend about this the other day, like you only get like the polarization, you only see the extremes in the media. Right. And you get this idea that the world is made up of like, you know, I don't know, QAnon on one side and then like the PC police on the other. And like, you don't really see the middle a lot. It's not well represented in the media or on the internet. So you get this impression that, yeah, the world is very, very divided. And it's maybe in some ways it is, but it's probably not as bad as they make it seem. Yeah. That's my thing too, is like, well, is it deliberate then? Do they want us to be divided? Why? Well, that's I, the conspiracy I, side of my head. I don't think that's a conspiracy. I think that's a given. I mean, listen, we can talk about flat earth and reptiles and stuff and get into some real conspiracies. But I think the fact that the the, the 1% or whoever's in charge, are, they benefit from us being divided. And that's why our political systems are designed to be essentially antagonistic, like blue team versus red team. Yeah. Right. I mean, they, they literally draw a line and then they go, all right, you guys you know, pair up or whatever, get, get in and get on your sides. And it's, mm. it's essentially a battle. It's not a, um, there's no attempts at collaboration or working together or, you know, finding things that we agree on and let's pu push those through because we're on the same side here. It's like, no, no, no. If you believe that I have to believe the opposite. There's no other way. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it, it serves them because even when, uh, like a political party loses an election, they haven't lost anything. They'll be back in four years to run again. And, you know, the, the, their politicians are still getting paid and they haven't lost anything. The real losers is us. Basically, yeah. every four years, every time we have to go out and vote, trading blue for red, it's like we're the ones losing every time. Mm. You think it's like some kind of game that like, so who, who do you think is actually in power then? Oh, I wouldn't pretend to know that. I mean, I do think that I, I do. I I would suspect that it's basically the people who pay the pay the bills i mean especially in like for example i don't think the canadian political system is any different i think it's just less extreme but i think in in the u.s i mean literally the 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 wealthy people are pumping money into the political parties and the political parties are essentially just representing those interests so yeah uh, so i think ultimately yeah whoever's got the money and whoever's paying the the, the politicians is the the one in charge so you know the rich yeah essentially yeah the coke brothers and yeah. yeah they don't want us to realize that because money isn't real like mm -hmm. we talked about there's no substance behind it so that their power is the power that we give them yeah. through through because we don't know that they have power so we think that the politicians have all this power so we assign so through the divide we assign like oh i'm a democrat i'm a republican mm -hmm. and we just get they they want us to fight in between like between ourselves so like you know while we have these bankers mm -hmm. like charles or the Koch brothers while they're while they actually are deciding things like yeah. oh look at those plebeians fighting amongst themselves <laughs> peasants you know, here there's peasants as i'm counting my billions of dollars Essentially, yeah. yeah i mean yeah like you said that doesn't seem like a conspiracy that actually is probably it's the truth very demonstrable it's no it's provable i mean yeah i don't think it's a conspiracy at all i mean you know that corporations are people in your country and they're allowed to donate all kinds of money to the politicians and you know i've seen some of these memes where it's like the politicians should have to wear nascar jackets with all their sponsors right and it's like yeah. it, there's no denying it you can see this it's uh very clear they're almost transparent about it in a way and it's infuriating because it's like they know that we're not going to do shit about it. They're not even trying to hide it half the time anymore. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. They're just brazen. They're like, whatever. These guys are too busy fighting each other. We don't need to worry about them. Let's just fucking do whatever we want. <laughs> and, and, and they're right because yeah, as, as long as we keep thinking that we're Republicans and Democrats, uh, you know, I don't know, name any other divide, as long as we identify as men or women or black or Spanish or white or whatever, as long as that, as long as we believe that that's what we are, we have no hope in hell to, to overcome this and become exactly. a, a united global family. Um, that's the only obstacle in my opinion. As soon as we all get on the same page and realize, holy shit, you're just another me. Whoa. <laughs> you might like different people or you might believe different things about God, but you're basically just another me. Why would I want to fuck myself over? Right. Why would I want to hurt myself? Is when we get that in our heads, I think, then we will see for, for real change, <laughs> not just yeah. superficial technological change, but like deep cultural change where we'll actually be able to practice some of the things that Jesus taught about loving your neighbor and all that. 
Exactly. That's a great segue getting back into the Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I do. I do want to talk to you about the the topic that you mentioned, because I think, you know, I was walking around in my yard earlier before we, we got on this and I was, I have some fruit trees and they're all coming to life after being, you know, skeletal and dead all winter. And, you know, I started thinking about our conversation that we were going to have and the topic of, you know, death and resurrection and, you know, this being the time of year for that, like, you know, it just seems like, we took what was happening in nature and kind of um, expanded on it in a lot of ways, right. With the whole story of death and resurrection. And so, yeah, if you want to talk about that, I would love to see your thoughts on it and we kind of already started a little bit, but yeah. Uh, well, we are nature. Mm -hmm. People think we're disconnected from nature. So why would we not also be part of that cycle and that process? That's pretty much the basis of it. Like, you know, when you get out in nature, you, you just see an, an extension of yourself. Yeah, well so said. I just see, see as a, I mean, not you. You don't even have to be reborn in another life, like in another incarnation. You can be reborn in this life. You can, you can, essentially too. I think sometimes I think the sim, uh, symbology behind the birth and redeath is like also like killing your ego. Mm. Re, you're, and then you're reborn after that. I think that's a huge thing that the world needs to <clears throat> get through right now is. Like just we have to just just kill our ego, and I know that people are like obsessed with that. Like, oh, you got to kill the ego, but it's essentially just like it's almost like changing the ego. It's almost like seeing your ego in a new light or working with it differently, and not identifying as the ego. Mm -hmm. I think that's a that's a huge thing that maybe Jesus was talking about. I don't know. It's just like through the you know <clears throat> the the rebirth is a rebirth of of your your identity. It's the rebirth of knowing who you are. Um, not necessarily being reborn after this life in this body. Maybe that happens. I don't know. I'm not going to act like I know it might. But I think <clears throat> keeping it relevant in this life, you're able to kill your ego. You're able to, you know, uh, if you're able to like decondition yourself from how we've been conditioned, because essentially our ego, we were molded into our ego. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's not that's not our essence. We from from our from birth, pretty much our from from whenever we first started uh, to understand English, I guess, or first started to understand things, we were molded into a certain being, a certain kind of way to see the world, and it probably most likely wasn't the right way unless you were raised at some. Tibetan <laughs> ashram, like most likely you were molded in in, in a way that to, of the ego, especially in the Western world. Like this is all about the ego. The, the America, Canada, what the Western world. It's all about materialistic gain, money, uh, lust, whatever. Insert out, outwardly pleasure here. It's all mm. about that, and that's all egoistic things. So yeah. I think, I think. Uh, you know, the whole thing behind birth and redeath is just like you have, I mean, re, uh, rebirth is killing. And it sounds horrible. It sounds really like strong. Maybe there's a different word for it that I can't remember <laughs> right now. But like reworking your sense of identity to reside in the Christ consciousness, mm -hmm. the second coming. Yeah. And that's kind of like the basis behind it, you know? Yeah. That's where we have to do and act upon that is like reside in that, reside in love essentially and then that's that's who you are we are love we act out of love and uh and we we get love we we get love into us and then we give love essentially hmm. yeah yeah i hope that made sense Does that makes sense but, well, you're preaching to the choir, buddy. So obviously it makes sense to me. I mean, uh, you, I mean, you touched on a bunch of things I was going to already ask you. So, I mean, yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that the idea of uh, death and rebirth can be read in many different ways. And like I was talking about the sort of natural world and how it goes through this cycle every year. Right. Um, and physically, I mean, there, there's parts of us that are dying right now and there's parts of us that are being made right now by this body too, right? Cells that are being, uh, you know, that are deteriorating and new cells that are being created. Created. So we're constantly in a state of death and rebirth physically, let's say. Um, but yeah, the spiritual level is what I'm obviously interested in. And the, um, the idea that you can, let's say, crucify your ego and that a few days later, it'll be reborn as the Christ. You know, I think that's, that's kind of what the uh, parable is all about. And I think 
one interesting detail in that story to me is that at some point, Jesus, when he's crucified on the cross, he loses hope. And he says, why have you forsaken me, Father? Now that's Jesus, the man speaking. That's not the Christ speaking. For, that's the last, that's the death cry of the ego right there. Why me? Uh, Why me? <laughs> what is happening to me, Father? Right? Because mm -hmm. the ego is attached. The ego wants to control. The ego is fearful. And when the ego dies, even if it's only for a few days, it allows that Christ consciousness to manifest itself uh, in a, in a stronger way. And it gains more of a foothold in an individual. So in my experience, that process of nailing the ego up on a cross, um, you might have to do it a lot. And then, you know, I'm still doing it. It's not like it's yeah. the ego, the ego keeps coming back. I don't think you can really kill it or get yeah. rid of it permanently, but I think it's more just a concept. Yes. Like it's not, you're not actually like killing anything and it's not like a permanent state it's just like the concept that you hold in your yeah. head of just like don't act from don't act from the ego you have yeah. to like check yourself you know, the person you, you think you yourself. are yeah the person exactly. you think you are the story you, that you tell yourself about life and yourself and the world and sacrifice that yeah it'll come back but every time it'll come back a little different and it'll be more in alignment with you know christ consciousness or whatever you want to call it your higher self let's say um, because when the story or the ego is gone temporarily, you realize that you're still here. Hmm, so yeah. therefore you're not the ego. You're not the story. You can't be because even when you kill that story or you sacrifice it and it's gone for a while, you're still around. So you must be something deeper than that superficial story or that role that you play as Gary Haskins or Oliver Belisle or whatever. There's something else behind that, right? Yeah. Let's say that's the costume or the, or the role. Uh, you're the actor. And, you know, personally, I think it's the same actor playing all the roles. So that makes it interesting. But um, yeah, the only way to get that sort of that, yeah, the only way to bring that consciousness to the forefront is to get the ego out of the way, even if only temporarily. Yeah. You think you can do it permanently? Is that an enlightened being? Yeah, I think some people can. I'm not looking to do that. Yeah, I that's feel like, like that's pretty... That's pretty intense. Yeah. And I mean, yeah. I, and I don't know that those people necessarily achieve it on purpose either. I think it's something that maybe happens to certain people like um, I'm Ramana Maharshi, as you mentioned, I think that was his story, right? As a teenager, he had this very profound experience. And then he said that from that point onwards, he was always connected to that uh, Atman or that higher self that that's where he spent and the rest of his life in that place. So I think it can happen, but I don't know that it's something that's either preferable or something that you should necessarily pursue. I think just integrating the ego into your whole self and turning it into something that is uh, like the servant instead of the master, right? Most of us, I think, are ruled by the ego, whereas the ego should be a servant of the higher self. It should be something that helps you. It's the it's the accountant. It's the day, you know the trip planner. Like the ego, the mind is very useful in a lot of ways. It's not wanting to get rid of that. It's making sure that it's subservient to the higher self. Yeah, it's needed. It's so it's like you said, it's a tool. But it's like knowing that that's the, that's it's becoming to the awareness of that. Because like I like you know I I think I'm I know I'm Gary Haskins, but I take that as a joke. Like I know that like I'm using that. that my, that symbol is me in this image that you see on the screen right now and the voice that you hear. I'm using that, that, which is the ego that I just described in myself as a symbol. I recognize that I am just a concept in your head, but I'm using that and using my ego, which is pretty big. <laughs> I'm using that as a symbol for others, you know? Mm. And mm -hmm. I think that's kind of what, that's the essence of it. It's not like you, like you said, it's not like you kill it. And it goes away forever. It's like you kill how you view it, I guess. Mm. You kill how you view yourself. Yeah, and it's a con. Like I said, it's a constant process. It's a. It's a. It, it's never really. I always have to keep checking myself, make sure mm. I don't get too lost in my own ego, mm -hmm. and then, uh, yeah, just it's it's how we utilize it. No matter what, we all as a human being, you're never really gonna escape that. Yeah, I don't think you know you have to know how to just work with it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I agree. 
Uh, yeah. And, and maybe some people do lose it permanently, like Mar- Ramana Maharshi or Jesus or whoever. Although, again, the story I just told you of Jesus, you know, why have you forsaken me? To me, that sounds like the ego straight up. Uh, the ego doesn't have faith, right? The ego uh, clings to things and uh, the higher self knows. It doesn't have to ask. It just knows, right? And it uh, it's comfortable letting go because it realizes that it doesn't have anything to hold on to anyways. It's just an illusion. So, um the other thing that I think is interesting with the whole uh, death and rebirth motif is um, uh, like dark nights of the soul. I don't know if you've ever had that experience. Definitely. Yeah. Of yeah. And like how, when you're in the middle of it, like when you're in the midst of one of these like really dark episodes or depressions or whatever, you know, like sometimes to me anyways, it feels like, well, oh, it's, a, this is going to be forever. Hmm. You know what I mean? Have you ever had that feeling where you're like, fuck, am I ever going to get out of this pit? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Cause that's what it seems like. I don't know, but I'm at a point where like, if that happens to me, which that has actually mm-hmm. recently, I guess, I don't mm-hmm. know. Maybe it has, but I always know that like, Oh, I know this isn't forever. Yeah. But it does feel like that. Like there's something where it's like, damn, I'm going to be stuck like this forever. I'm going to feel like poop forever. But mm-hmm. like, I don't, I don't know why. I think that's just another test. I think that's just a test for our egos because that dark night of the soul thing is like, that's kind of like your ego telling you like, oh, this is, this is it. You, you know, <laughs> you're, you're identifying with that, like the, the death of it. Like you're identifying with that. Like you you think you're dying. Mm-hmm. It's really not you. Right. I don't know. Yeah. That's interesting. Hey, right? but then, you know, it's kind of like when you're uh, literally going through winter, you know, the days are short and it's dark and miserable and you feel like, God damn it. You know, is this ever going to end? And then yeah, you get to this time of year and it's like the trees are, you know, the buds are popping up and the birds are chirping and it's a beautiful day out and it's getting warmer and you feel like, Oh yeah. Okay. All right. We're getting out of this. Right. And I, <laughs> to me, it's like that, what you described, you know, when you're going through the dark night of the soul and you're like, part of you knows that it's temporary. I feel like the, this whole uh, time of year is a good reminder for that as well, that, you know, yeah. no matter what darkness you go through, there is a spring coming, right. Uh, mm-hmm. Whether it's literal or spiritual or whatever. Um, so yeah, that, that's the other sort of allegory or sort of symbolic meaning to, uh, to this time of year for me is like, yeah, having gone through several <laughs> dark nights of the soul, uh, I've come to learn now that it's like, just hold on. It's, yeah. it'll end. The sun will be back. Temporary. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the, sun, the sun comes back. It does. <laughs> the sun. It's, it's funny how the sun coming back is like Jesus coming back. Is there, mm-hmm. is there something in the language there? The son of God. Yeah. I mean, and again, maybe I'm biased from this manly P hall book that I'm reading, but for him, it's like, everything comes back to the sun moon symbols, right? Astrology as well. The astrological symbols. He spends a lot of time going through, you know, the 12 uh, signs of the Zodiac, the sun, the moon, and how, and then he shows you through all these different like world myths, like how this person is a symbol of the sun and yeah jesus according to him anyways is is just another solar deity basically um and yeah the fact that around this time you know the days start to get longer and stuff like that there's no doubt in my mind that's there's a connection there somewhere yeah it's interesting how our our the basis of the the reality that we live in is polarity Mm -hmm. you know there's a there's a reason why the the symbol of yin and yang resonates so much as i see that behind you (laughs) there's something something about like even at the minuscule level like the whole process of this universe and even internally there's this yin and yang element there's this this dark and light Mm -hmm. good and bad birth and and death you can't have one without the other and it's it's like it's constant it seems throughout the entire universe or our entire world like you need you can't have one without the other. Zero or one. Computers, binary. Yeah. Zero and one. Yeah. Yes and no. Everywhere. It's just like polarities. Yeah. It's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, the image of the the Tao, you know, the yin and yang, I think is essentially, uh, that's the blueprint of everything in the entire universe. Everything that is and isn't is based on this one blueprint of the Tao, the the symbol of yin and yang. I think it represents the, the fundamental nature of reality, which is like you said, uh, polarity, right? Yeah. You know, even being and non-being or matter and space, right? I mean, like what is, is defined by what 
isn't, you know what I mean? Like the, yeah. the, the way that I define this water bottle is because there's a bunch of nothingness around it and it becomes a, a thing, right? If yeah. there was, if there was other stuff attached to it, then it wouldn't no longer be a water bottle. But um, yeah. So everything that is is defined by what it isn't and every, you know, and everything that isn't is defined by what is. And it's kind of like this weird mind fuck because mm-hmm. you can't have one without the other. So yeah, it's, it's not, paradox. yeah, it's not dualistic. It's, it's, it transcends duality because the opposites are actually one in the same it's just like you said opposite ends of a spectrum maybe but it's they're unified they define each other and they uh co-create in a way right yeah that's why i don't believe we when we die there's the void because you can't just have doesn't exist void. yeah you can't have nothing without something you can't have something without nothing mm-hmm. i used to believe that when you die that's it you just you go to sleep and it's black darkness forever and that's it man it's over Mm-hmm. I'm like, it doesn't compute. That doesn't, maybe to my ego, maybe to my viewpoint in this body, yeah. yes. But I think in another which way, there's always going to be some kind of consciousness that's experienced something. And if you identify with that consciousness that's experienced something, you never die. Yeah. You know? Well. Everyone's just afraid of the body dying. Everyone attaches themselves to the body, which I'm, I already know I'm going to perish someday. That's mm-hmm. okay, because I know I, I identify with just consciousness itself, which never dies, because yeah. in order, you can't, it just, you can't, because if you need to have something in order to have nothing, you need mm-hmm. to have consciousness in order to have the void. Mm-hmm. So to me, that's salvation, knowing that there is everlasting life, and it might not be in another human life, it might be some kind of transcendent realm that I can't even fathom that goes beyond any kind of rational concept that i could put in my heart put in my mind but just knowing that there is everlasting somethingness Mm -hmm. is that's cool to me that means like you know i don't know it's it's like immortality like i get to live forever not in this body but that's okay because if it was forever then it wouldn't be as fun yeah well that implies that you've been alive forever as well i mean it means that before you 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 before you were even born, you were around. I mean, you, mm-hmm. if you're that consciousness, that consciousness is ever present. So yeah. uh, the, the way that I like to mess with my own mind sometimes is I try to think of like the earliest memories that I have, like as a, as, as a child. Right. And then I'm like, okay, so like, as far as my conscious experience goes, this is where it begins. But I was obviously alive before this. Right. So I'm like, okay, so maybe I was like six years old or five years old or something, my earliest memories. Right. So from my perspective, it's like almost like my, there's a light that comes on at that point, but I know that I existed before that. Right. Um, And I know that I existed even in the womb. And so for me, it's like, if I don't have a beginning really, then how can I have an ending? Right. How can I end if I never began? Because I don't remember my beginning. And I don't even know when my beginning is like, who knows, maybe I have a conscious experience of, uh, you know, being a sperm or something in the testicle. I don't know. Right. All I know is at some point I have memories, but I was around before then. And I was around before I was even born. I was in the womb. And before that I was around as well physically. So yeah, to me, it's like, I never wasn't. So how could I ever stop being at any Mm -hmm. point? Right. I've always been, and I always will be not in this body. As you said, uh, you know, I don't think I'm going to go on with this thing, especially with the mileage that I'm putting on it. (laughs) (laughs) Um, but, uh, but I think that, yeah, absolutely. The thing behind the body, the thing behind the role and the name and the ego, the thing that is aware and that just is, that will always be, and it always will continue. I mean, there's no end to that. Yeah. Pretty cool. (laughs) Yeah. I hope again, I hope, but if there is an end to it, you know, no biggie. It's I just, like sleeping. That's how, so it goes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I know, right? I like sleeping. That's the way I look at it too. I'm like, hey, I enjoy on I I enjoy being unconscious. <laughs> yeah. It's one of my <laughs> favorite <funny>. things. <laughs> rest. Yeah. That's why they say rest in peace. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm getting to that age where it's like I want to stay up and play video games after my kids go to bed and then it's like I end up falling asleep. I can't even make it up past like eleven thirty. So yeah. Uh, if if that's what I got to look forward to uh in the end, then great. Love sleeping. But uh I think again, if you want to talk about non-duality, sleep. Um sleep basically implies wakefulness. And so if you're asleep, you will wake up again. Mm. And if you're awake, you will go to sleep at some point, right? And so even if I go to sleep, I do think there is a waking up at some point. 
You're a very wise man, Oliver. Uh, just the stories I tell myself to make me feel good about death. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. It really is. I, uh, I, had, I did have a, a very interesting experience. I've, I actually never told anybody about this. Well, I've told, I told my wife about it and I told one other friend about it um, when I was like 17. And it was the most psychedelic experience I've ever had, but it came from smoking weed, which is uh, strange. But anyways, everybody was smoking weed and, and I had this weird reaction to it. And, um, I watched like the world around me disintegrate, <laughs> like oh, everything, weird. dude, it was <laughs> intense. I'm not joking. Uh, and nobody else had a reaction to it. So we all had the same stuff and it's not like anybody drugged me. Like we were all smoking from the same bong, mm. but whatever happened, it triggered something in me. Anyways, I watched the whole world disintegrate until there was nothing left, but a single fucking particle. My body was gone. I was just this disembodied consciousness with this one like ball, Bing, right? That's nice. And I was terrified. And then, and then I started to calm down because it's like, oh, okay, wait, I'm still here, right? Like I still exist. That's fucking weird. And so for, I don't know how long I was with this particle, but eventually the particle started to like go and then it went and it became two particles. And I was like, oh, what the fuck? And then those two went and they became four. And I was like, mm. and then it was like, it started to speed up. Right. And then all of a sudden it was like, the world was coming back into being. And I was back on this deck with my friends wow. and uh, I was laying on my back. I had fallen over and hit my head. Uh, my friends called an ambulance cause they were freaked the fuck out. And when I came back to it, my buddy was like, are you all right? And I, I started laughing and crying and I kept telling him, I fucking saw it, man. I saw it. I understand. It goes on forever. The end is just another beginning. And my friends were like, dude, you're, we called an ambulance. You're going to the hospital, buddy. <laughs> so, Amazing. but that happened to me when I was like 16, 17, and it always stayed with me. And so, yeah, I don't know if that was just some kind of weird mental schizophrenic break or hallucination, but I felt, and I still feel very, very certain and confident that this thing just goes on and on, baby. Yeah. It has no end because it has no beginning. It's just mm -hmm. constantly wheeling around. And yeah. so, you know, if that's the case, then you and I have probably been here a bunch of times already and uh, we'll probably be here again. And, uh, you know, it is what it is. Yeah, we'll, we'll have another podcast again. <laughs> yeah, maybe the same one. Maybe it'll be different. But yeah, I feel like it just goes on, right? So just a big recycler. Yeah. Yeah. So there you go. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Death and rebirth. That's interesting, man. That's interesting <laughs> that you got that from weed, man. That's pretty crazy. I mean, I've definitely had some extreme experiences from cannabis, but yeah. you saw the origin of the universe. The beginning and the end. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I mean, like, I, you know, I didn't talk to my parents. I didn't talk to anybody about it, you know, until much later because I was like, you know, it took me a while to get, uh, get my head around it and to also, you know, kind of realize like, okay, I'm not crazy. You know, I'm back to normal. So it's not like I had this mental breakdown, like my, my, everything was back to normal the next day, but yeah, of all the things that could trigger something like that, it was just a fucking bong hit, buddy. <laughs> this is a very, it can, it's a very powerful psychoactive substance. If it's used on the right person, some people, they just like getting high and eating, watching a movie. Mm -hmm. But I think if you have the right mindset, you can open up a lot of things. It does, it does for me. Like I mm -hmm. actually haven't even been smoking that much anymore because it gets pretty intense. Yeah. But like uh, some other people, they can just do it all day long and they don't have the, they don't see the origin of the universe. But I think it just comes down to your, 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 your makeup, your neurological makeup in your mind. If you're, you know, if you have a certain kind of predisposition, cannabis is extremely powerful. And I've heard that from other people as well. Uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a plant medicine, just like anything else. It's a yeah. psychedelic substance, just like anything else. But it's just interesting to me how some people have experiences with it that are, you know, comparable to like DMT or LSD <laughs> or something, or, yeah. but then you have other people that just like to do it just to feel good. So it's, Hey man, cannabis is a mystery to me. It always will be. It's such an amazing, it's like, it's like, it's just, a, it's a plant that could, Every time I smoke it, it's just like a mystery. It's just like, what is this showing me? It's 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 crazy, man. Because I've had experiences like you. Yeah. I mean, I didn't see the whole particle thing, but yeah, just whatever. crazy revelatory experience. Yeah, yeah. I've also had experiences where I'm just watching a movie and feeling good, just yep. smoking some weed. So it's just, I don't know. It's a mystery. It's the herb, man. 
<laughs> it's I'm like you now. I mean, I, I, after that experience, I didn't do it for a long time, probably 10 years. Uh, you know, maybe I had a, the odd puff, but like, I didn't touch it for a long, long time. And then around like 27, 28, uh, I had a buddy who was really into it. Actually my buddy, uh, out in Alaska now, uh, he was always the stoner of the group. And, uh, eventually he got me on board, you know, we were playing like settlers of Catan with some friends and I was like, all right, fuck it, let's go outside and have a toke or whatever. And, uh, yeah, I, I started getting into it and, um, became a, a habitual consumer, let's say. And like you, I can have an experience where I'm just hanging out on the couch with my wife, watching a show or whatever, or I can have this like revelation about myself that like, I've been, uh, totally fucking betraying my own principles or like, you know, I've been a hypocrite about something or I've wronged somebody at work and I didn't even yeah. realize it. And it's like, you're just like, holy shit, dude, like <laughs> calm down, like your heart's jacked out of, you know, I'm like, Oh God. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it can have a lot of different effects. And, uh, when you were talking about it, um, what it reminded me of is, uh, cultivating connections. You know, those guys, right. You had oh, yeah. a podcast mm -hmm. with them. They do a Sunday. They have a ritual. They smoke once, a, once a week and they get so much out of it. And I was like, fucking kudos to you guys. Yeah. That's pretty awesome because yeah, they're using it like you were saying with a certain intention and with a set and setting and the uh, effects of it seems to be like mind blowing for them. Like they, they come to some yeah. crazy realizations and they go through all this like, you know, shadow work and integration and it's wild. Yeah. It's just a tool. Like we talked about before, if you know how to use it, um, it can, it can yield amazing results. It's just, uh, it's just a tool. Yeah. What do you think the, what do you think the paranoia is about? Because I know some people who don't do it because every time they do it, like a hundred percent of the time, like they'll have those types of like anxiety ridden paranoia experiences. Do you think it's just like the makeup, like you were talking about, or do you think there might be something else to that? I don't know. I'm trying let me think about that one. Cause like I've experienced the paranoia before and I think maybe, I don't know if it's like paranoia that's induced by actual like it, it's something that i should actually be paranoid about or it's just like irrational paranoia mm. I, I don't know where it comes from and maybe it is deep like dark th not dark thoughts but it's like deep thoughts that we should be thinking about or it's just things that it may be like an illusion i don't know mm -hmm. if it's like you know our mind playing a trick on us when we smoke or it actually is the truth and that's why i say it's a mystery i don't i really have no clue <laughs> i have no clue why it, yeah. it's, it's such a mystery i think it's just um if I had to guess, it's just like bringing to light some unconscious happenings in our mind that we wouldn't normally think about. Mm. That's probably that's probably what it does. I mean, I don't really, I don't know. Like, I yeah, said, I have no clue. No, that sounds. I mean, that's definitely what it does for me sometimes. Um, but um, not every time. And uh, and maybe maybe also because when when that happens to me, I actually act on it. I don't just. Uh, sweep it under the rug right like if i have some you know revelation or something you know i'll question it and sometimes it turns out to be irrational like you're saying but other times there's something legitimate and it's like okay i gotta do this or i gotta change that or i gotta make up for this or whatever so yeah i just find it interesting that some people can't at all tolerate it at any point which you know like you said it might just be your chemical makeup or whatever yeah or just they can't handle the subconscious because <laughs> sometimes I, I like yeah, death yeah yeah i i uh, cannabis also makes me think about my own demise sometimes too which is interesting like i smoke it and i'm just like damn like i'm like what's what's really going on like it makes me think like Oof, like it, it opens up the floodgates to um perception hmm. it opens the doors of perception hmm. you know yep. it uh i don't know how to explain it like uh i, I like i'm completely calm now I'm I'm in my room, had a nice Sunday, went for a walk. I'm at peace, but then if I smoke a little bit of weed, not not guaranteed, maybe like if I smoke, if I got really high right now, I'd start like really internalizing what it means to be a human. I'd be like, damn, <laughs> I'm on a rock. Oh I'm yeah, going through space. <laughs> What's going on? Like my, I have billions of cells that are that are working and doing their own thing. And then I just, it's just like putting my mind on overload and mm -hmm. about things that I necessarily don't want to think about. Uh, but sometimes I like that. Mm -hmm. It's it's weird. Sometimes I like that rush and I need that rush in my life. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a, I don't know. It's like marijuana, man. It's like having a relationship with a woman, you know, it's like sometimes it's like, it's a, it's a love hate thing. It's like sometimes <laughs> I just, 
I just I need it sometimes. It's just like it's too much. I'm just like <laughs> it's a, I have a weird relationship with the plant. Man. It's very strange. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. And then you work in the industry too, so you probably you know, it's not like you. Uh, um, it's not like you have uh, any trouble accessing it, right? It's probably a, a available and ready supply. I imagine. Yeah, I'm the guy if you need it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. That's hilarious. Yeah, and what's interesting also about it too is there's different cannabinoids other than THC. Mm-hmm. Delta Delta Nine THC is the popular cannabinoid. Yeah, uh, there's there's way other way more medicinal benefits to it like CBD, CBG, yep. CBC, CBN. All of these all of these things hold. Uh, enormous potential for our being and those things don't really make you paranoid either i think there's, no. there's so much potential in exploring these other cannabinoids for actual medicinal uses yeah because you know not everybody wants to get high but but a lot of people could benefit from just from the the physical uh the physical benefits that all these other cannabinoids bring yeah to you. Yeah, I've heard that. Do you think that the um, the uh, indica versus sativa thing might play into the paranoia as well? Like, have you found that um, certain like the indicas are worse for that, or it's just all the same to you? Personally, I don't believe in that. I think that's just people. I don't believe that because all the difference, the only difference between sativa and indica is the lineage, like the genetics of where it came from, okay. and it doesn't change the molecules that are in it. Like, if something's indica. It doesn't change the actual chemical happenings in your brain, as opposed to sativa. Okay. If there if there is some kind of different chemical makeup between the two uh, different uh, species, I don't know if the species is the right word. Mm-hmm. Then there has to be some other chemical that's interacting with us, other than the cannabinoids. Okay. That's Interesting. the only way that I could really justify it, because if, if there is a difference between sativa and indica, then like, all right, so what's in the sativa that's not in the indica, or what's in the indica that's right. not in the sativa? But and there's nothing. Them, there's nothing. They both have the same the same exact cannabinoids. I think it's just like a placebo effect that Interesting. have been brainwashed into. That's wow. just my opinion. I don't know. I might be wrong. But like, well, yeah, but it's an interesting take. I mean, I've never heard that before. Whereas the, the, the science is like, I think, you know, all of these things are, it's just chemicals, right? Yeah. It's just chemicals that are going, it's literally, we have an endocannabinoid system. The, mm-hmm. the THC goes into our brain. We get high. Well, they both have THC. And nothing else, like the same exact cannabinoid. So how is there any kind of difference? Like I said, unless somebody comes up with some kind of scientific thing and they discover a new chemical that's in one and not in the other, mm-hmm. um, that's when I'll that's when I'll believe it. Interesting. But I don't I don't believe the difference because it's just like it's just simple. Like all of these psychedelics just come down to certain chemicals that 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 are that lock onto certain neural uh, you know they just receptors like key receptors yep. in our brain yep. and they allow us to go through a trip or go through the high mm-hmm. it's that simple it's not yep. like you know the it's i don't know you know what i'm trying to say yeah 100 percent. yeah yeah I'm, and i'm just trying to think of like um again just for for the interest of the conversation some counter examples like i'm trying to think like there's caffeine so we have caffeine receptors in our brains right same idea right um the effects of a uh, black coffee versus a green tea uh, physiologically for me huge difference again Definitely. if you so so maybe it's a, an, a question of not all caffeine is made the same or there's different types of caffeine. So like the THC from a sativa plant would be different somehow than the THC in an indica plant. Again, I'm just throwing things out there. I just don't know. But I mm. it, well, again, coffee and caffeine thing There's way more caffeine in coffee than there is green tea. So it's just the concentration. I of see the, the chemical. When right. maybe, yeah, maybe there might be more concentration of THC in an indica plant or certain strains of the indica plant yeah. that make you higher. Yeah. It could be something like that. Yeah. You know? but or maybe it's, it's the same exact molecular, molecular structure, mm-hmm. both of the plants. I don't see how there's any kind yeah. of difference. That makes sense though. You're right. I mean, it. I never even th- stopped to question that. I just kind of assumed that people knew what they were talking about. <laughs> and yeah. it seemed like such a like popular sort of common Honestly, man, point, you, you know? I, I've been in, I've been working in the industry for two years. Just because you are a stoner doesn't mean you know about <laughs> <laughs> well, in fact, as I would not trust stoners actually <laughs> to tell me about that stuff. Yeah, no, they just, it's just people that like getting high, but like there are yeah. people that if you like learn about the cannabis plant, there's, you know, there, there are people that know about the cannabis plant, yeah. but just because you like smoking the cannabis plant doesn't mean you- Doesn't mean you, you know, know anything about it. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Well, 
that was a, a lot of different topics there, my friend. Yeah. But it was Ended good. It on weed. <laughs> yeah, we, I know, right? What a great way to end it. I don't think I've ever talked about cannabis on my channel before. So, I, I mean, this is a great first time for me. And uh, it's something that, you know, like I haven't really, you know, even the psychedelics thing until I started doing the podcast, you know, in the last few months or whatever. It's not a topic that came up frequently on the channel just because I was really focused on like the philosophy and the, you know, the spirituality and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, it's kind of hard to keep these things separated, isn't it? yeah that's for sure it's, it's not you know they they go hand in hand you know i wasn't spiritual quote unquote spiritual until i tried mushrooms yeah it really that really accelerated my spirituality it yeah was, there was a whole package like i was into meditation and stuff but mushrooms allowed me to like really dive into what it means to be spiritual and the whole like you know, esoteric ways to look at life um, so yeah, it's very hard to disconnect those because a lot of people's catalysts to spirituality are psychedelics. Like Ram Dass, for example, he, yeah. he, didn't, he wasn't into it until, you know, he was some Harvard psychologist, you know, by the book kind of guy, yeah. in the materialistic world. Then he tried mushrooms and he said it opened him up and he became, he went from Richard Alpert to Ram Dass. Yeah, man. <laughs> well, and he, his, his description of that first psychedelic trip at Tim Leary's house is basically ego death. He saw himself as a professor and he got rid of that. He saw himself as a, you know, a connoisseur of fine wines, dismissed that all the way until it was just naked Richard Alpert sitting there. And then he got rid of that. And then he was like, what the fuck? I'm still here. <laughs> That's exactly right. what we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah. They're not needed. You don't need to have. No, them. it's just they help. They fucking they can, help. <laughs> they can they can help in the right circumstances. Yeah. They can help you get to the other side, the other shore 100%. of existence, as Buddha would say. Yeah. Well, and I, you know, it's kind of fascinating for me, like um, my, what I call my cubicle epiphany when I was around, I think probably 29 years old, I had this, again, a mystical experience that kind of set me on this path. And uh, I don't think it's a coincidence that I started smoking weed about a year and a half before that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I think it really uh, dissolved certain barriers that I had. I think it opened me up to certain possibilities that I would have either dismissed or just disregarded entirely. And I think it really just primed me. I wasn't stoned, obviously, when it happened, my, my cubicle epiphany, but I think that just, it just primed me. Like it, it allowed that experience to happen, whereas maybe it wouldn't have happened otherwise. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Totally, man. It's, it's, it's a beautiful thing that we have these plant allies. I call them, they're, they're, they're here for us to show us things. If, if you receptive, mm -hmm. you know, if you have that mindset. Yeah. Very cool, man. Yeah. Awesome, brother. Well, it was great chatting with you like usual. Yeah. You too, Oliver. You're a cool guy. I like talking to you. Like, <laughs> I feel like we just go back and forth really well, you know? It's I a, agree. It's a nice tennis match of, uh, of discussion that we have. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I think for, for our viewers, sometimes it might be frustrating because we don't really stay on one topic for very long, but fuck them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Fuck the reviewers. We don't care. About you guys. <laughs> yeah. No doubt. Awesome, man. It, well, it uh, relates though. It all, it's all in yes. the same umbrella. Well, yeah, I think what happens is the conversation kind of has a life of its own, right? And we just kind of follow it wherever it goes. Exactly, man. Go with the flow. All right, man. <laughs> well, happy Easter. Yeah. Happy Easter to you too, man. All right, dude. Well, let's connect and talk about what to do with this footage at a later time. <laughs> yeah, 100%, man. Uh, uh, yeah, just send it to me whenever it's good. I mean, you can use it. I guess I can use it too. And I mean, nobody's really stopping you, but you got the you got the file. So yeah, I'll, I'll uh, send you a Google Drive link like I usually do. And, uh, and, uh, and then yeah, you can do with it as you please as well. I mean, obviously, um, if you're going to post it on your channel, I'll just I'll let you do that and there's no need to double up on the content or anything like that. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's what I was planning actually. Sweet man. <laughs> to be yeah. honest with you. No, yeah, no, for sure. No, uh, that sounds good, buddy. I'll send it to you as soon as I, um, as soon as I can get it, uh, uploaded. Sounds good, Oliver. All right, man. Have a good day. Appreciate you, man. Have a Cheers. good day.